Welcome back to our Cormac Car Podcast for one last race of the year 2024. After 17 races, 15 weekends, or sort of another one if you count the third, well, we are there. Nashville is at a done and we're at the moment we sort of hoped we'd never get to. But hey, we still have an excellent race to review and we more importantly have a champion to look back on. Alex Pillow claiming his third IndyCar Championship in four years um, in the season finale at Nashville. I'm not going to say it was inevitable, but you know, all year Pillow looked fairly comfortable. It looked like this championship was going, going his way. It is a bit of a shame how it ended Will Powers Day pretty much done after about 10 laps due to a seatbelt failure. Uh, which basically gave Pillow the opportunity just to drive home to a third championship. But it doesn't take away from the fantastic year he's had, a fantastic race we've had at Nashville. Um, but Pillow on top again, as I think we all sort of thought at the start of the year, and we all thought coming into Nashville. And he's building a bit of a legacy. He's an Indy car great. He certainly is that now a three championship. He joins some of the very big names of the sport to have those and um, a worthy, very champion of our 2024 season. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible when you try and put it into context. I mean, he is, what, 27 years old and he's halfway to, to Scott Dixon's tally already within a five-year period in the series, within four years at Chip Ganassi Racing. And obviously the one year he didn't win the championship was obviously the year where all the off-track distractions were kind of ramping up. Um, it's incredible. I mean, yeah, of course, power was kind of in the fight, but it was a long shot anyway. Obviously, he had to kind of finish first or second, really, to stand any sort of chance and rely on Pelot having a very, very poor day. Uh, so he's a deserving champion. I think he spoke after after the race that it was probably his most consistent season yet, apart from maybe it tailed off a little bit in the last few rounds. But as we kind of spoke about, there was a run. Yeah, you know, he pretty much finished top five every single race unless he fell into a little bit of strife that largely wasn't out of his control aside from the the Iowa crash so yeah 11th place was actually one of his worst finishes but unfortunately it was kind of a bit an anti a bit of an anti-climax because he'd qualified well I was I was well poorly by his standards it was kind of average he qualified 15th but with a nine place engine penalty which kind of threw another spanner in the works he, he had to start down in 24th and that was 20 places behind power so that did lead to I guess a bit more anticipation for the race in the end and it was what lap 12 that power peeled into the pits and said that you know I, I tuned into his his radio as soon as that happened and he said he just felt it pop his uh his lap belt and and it was yeah just the most bizarre way to I don't want to say lose the championship because I mean, at that point, Pelot had already made his way up from from twenty fourth to sort of the mid teens. So, and, and Power was actually dropping back as well on the alternate tyres. So, it was looking like they may kind of end up meeting on track anyway. Um, but yeah, it was it was a bit of anti climax. It was a bit of a shame that Power's part was yeah Power's part in this was was taken away from him by such a weird little thing and it does seem it was a failure it happened again he said in the last 10 laps um yeah he, he drops him to fourth in the standings astonishingly but I, I don't think he cares too much about that yeah it's a bit weird because i've got to say McLaughlin and Herter had we both had that standing season so i don't really have any quibbles with that at all but yeah it's just, it's just a bit of a weird they was the closest contender and now he's fourth in the standings but hey, i mean yeah, I think that was Pillow's pretty much most disappointing performance of the entire year. We didn't really see him at all. He's pretty much you know, sort of fluctuated around the top 10. But yeah, we didn't, he wasn't at the front like he normally is. But hey, it doesn't matter. I think at that point, he was already half in party mode when he found out that power had to pull over. So it didn't really matter in the end. But uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, look, we look back at Pillow's season. We'll do more in-depth um, in depth analysis on this because we do have 24 weeks to do it. Um, but the stats speak for themselves. He's got... 13 top five finishes in the 17 race season, which is so impressive. As you said, it, it, the last two rounds weren't great. Admittedly, Milwaukee wasn't really his fault. Um, and look, it wasn't as dominant as he was last year, but this year was more consistent. And you know, we have seen a bit more of a human side to Pelé where he does make mistakes, he, he can have off days, but because he is so consistent the rest of the, the year, there is he's not he's almost unbeatable at times and he'll go on this run of form where he will just pick up result after result after result undeniably and it's what makes him so great his his 
well, just consistency is the overall word, but his calmness, his demeanor, you never you never see Pelo worked up or stressed. He's always so calm in the car, and that's what that's what brings him results. And he, as you said, the week power sort of highlighted this. Pelo is so good at finding the balance of knowing when and when not to do things because you don't see Pelo make silly overtakes or or regularly throw it in the wall. But you never see Pelo stuck behind cars and and having an off day. And he's so good at finding that balance, which is potentially the biggest factor to him winning these titles. Yeah, I actually find it it's it's strange that. He's he's probably put in his I don't want to say worst performance of the season, but yeah, I think as you said, maybe most anonymous to to wrap up the title. I guess he probably could have delivered a bit more if he really needed it, and Power was still in the race, and Power was was leading the race, for instance. But it's weird how the the kind of focus of the race just completely transitioned after Power had his issue, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the battle at the front was the the thing that had our attention and uh, I didn't really think of Polo that much until the uh, the end of the race, which I guess was a bit of a shame because it was there was some genuine excitement, I think, before the race that given how far apart they were starting that, yeah, I mean, we, we could have still unlikely, but, but some sort of battle. But no, I, I just completely echo everything you said, really, that I think it is this kind of He's just he's ruthless in it in his own way, Polo. He's ruthless in a way that's very measured, that's very yeah, I guess he knows where to where to take risks, knows where to play the percentages. And we saw that early in the race. I mean, he was making some decisive passes to to make up those seven, eight, however many places it was in the first sort of five laps or so to make that progress that he needed to do while, you know, there were still a couple of lanes open, etc. But yeah, obviously wasn't to matter in the end. I think just on power, I mean, this was the first season actually since 2008 that he has not had a pole. Um, I still think he started on the front row, must have been not got the stats four or five times through the year. But I just, I, I, I mean, I think he'll probably look back on it as one of his best seasons, to, to be quite honest. It was just, yeah, Polo is, Polo is so good and he is competing against all of these great IndyCar drivers and you know I was going to say not giving them a chance they had a slight chance but really kind of blowing them away in in some ways in these last few years and you could see him going on to get seven titles eight titles and it's not improbable at all we actually spoke to Chip Ganassi in the post event press conference at Nashville just asking him about what it's like working with Alex Pillow and kind of the journey they've been on and, and how the expectations he initially had have kind of translated. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, for whoever wants to take this, can you please just talk a bit about Alex Pillow as a character and not just as a driver? What is it like kind of working with Alex Pillow, the person, and, and just what is he like around the team? Well, I think, you know, a, a side of him that, that a lot of people don't see is is his humour. You know, he's got a, he's got a great sense of humour. And I think that's, uh, to me, that's important in the world today. Um, you know, there's a lot of things going on in this world on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think a guy, um, you know, Alex, yeah, he, he, he is as serious as they get as a race driver. But I'm also, I can tell you, he, uh, he has a, a good, sharp, uh, sharp wit and a sharp humor. And, um, and I, like, I like that a lot about him. And Kind of looking back to, to when Alex did first move over uh, to Ganassi, what kind of expectations did you did you have of him? Did you expect him to immediately be a champion, let alone did you expect him to be a three-time champion within a space of four seasons? Um, I can tell you that, that my expectation was that over, you know, I was just hoping that we we had a guy that could that 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 you know liked ovals and liked road races. And uh, was going to grow with the team. I had no, um, I had no idea what the four of the next three to the next four years were going to be like. I had no, if I told you I had any other idea or expectation, I'd be lying to you. <laughs> I had no idea it would be this much fun and this successful. Man, I'm glad we ditched those streets in Nashville. What a decision that was. Uh, I, well, I know it wasn't intentional or, or whatever, but what a decision it was because this was great racing. Loved it. Loved it. 
it was a bit like Texas a couple of years ago. Maybe it wasn't quite that good, but it re-emphasised the need for high-speed ovals. Look, I love Iowa, I love Milwaukee, but it isn't quite the same adrenaline as going to a super speed around a mile and a half. And Nashville was great. Superb racing, multi-lane racing. It was challenging for the drivers. The racing was just so superb. You had multi-lane racing, you had drivers making big moves. Um, people were utilising the high line where they could. Uh, fantastic. Loved loved every minute of it. And a huge credit to, to Scott Borchetta. I've already touched on him a bit more later. But he he made his decision to take a, take the event away from the streets, which was a bold, bold call, and bring it to the super speedway 45 minutes out of Nashville. And we, we came out with an absolute cracker of a race. Fantastic racing, different strategies, lead battles, everything you could really ask for in a in an IndyCar race. And Loved, loved the return to Nashville Super Speedway. I'm so glad it's back and hopefully it will be for, for years to come. I mean, Borchetta saved the event because obviously the, the due diligence was not done by the kind of previous leadership. And, you know, they didn't realise that, for instance, there wasn't going to be the paddock space by the uh, on the streets with the construction going on to the Tennessee Titans Stadium. So the event was, was in tatters, really, until he... He took over. Obviously, he was kind of the the big partner as the uh, I think CEO, chairman of uh, Big Machine Label Group. I think it is who are the the primary sponsor. But his involvement in the event obviously grew as he kind of took over and put in this review and at very short notice managed to get IndyCar to to the Super Speedway. And yeah, I mean, we we could have finished the season in Milwaukee if it wasn't for that. For for all we know, because the event was never going to happen on the streets if he couldn't get us to, to Nashville Super Speedway. I mean, that would have been a, a right kick in the face after all the promotion about, oh, we're finishing the season in Nashville. I mean, it was obviously bad enough and damning enough on the previous leadership after all of the talk about, oh, we're going to race downtown to the side of the so that, that that didn't happen. But, I mean, yeah, this was better, I suppose. Obviously, there have been entertaining races on the streets, but... I think this was this was a better race because obviously a lot of that relied on the the chaos and I think you know better there, there version were t- of entertaining. Yes, absolutely, and, and you know there were times where the race maybe had occasional rules, but it was it was very much in the school of of Milwaukee where passing wasn't necessarily easy. Like, and I think we saw that from kind of practice. The marbles built quite quickly, but the second lane was was able to be utilised, and I think it was another case of it really brought out the best in drivers and their skill and the way they had to time passes, pick passes off and set passes up. It was, it was really good. And I think especially late on, you know, I mean, again, while I guess the marbles were building, but drivers were just putting in some, some really bold moves and it was, yeah, I guess it was vintage again. And I think credit has to go to the series to Firestone as well for essentially nailing a package that, looking back to Iowa was was far from nailed and I know the repave there kind of played its part but they've rounded out the the Nashville event much like kind of looking back at Gateway Milwaukee with, with track records 653 on track passes 237 for position inside the top 10 117 on track passes inside the top five there were 42 all of those are IndyCar records at Nashville and you know in the previous iterations with previous cars um I mean, it was just one lane racing and that is, again, what what drivers expected. But yeah, okay, maybe for periods in the race, it it was a little bit more like that. But I think for the most part, you know, split strategies kind of merging, traffic obviously playing a part again. It was it was it was good fun. Now, let's give a little word to Colton Herter. I think last week you made a comment saying, Oh, this is whole theory. Polo isn't a good oval driver. Here's Herter, who hasn't yet won an oval race. A week later, it's come back to bite you a little bit. But no, well. <laughs> hey, I, I think I, I think I do recall saying though that I felt like Herter was one of the best oval drivers in the series. I was just confused okay. why. Yeah, you know, he or he were he also wasn't really. Yeah, hadn't really. I guess the attention though was on Polo, isn't it? Because he's yeah. this multi-time champion. Herter's not. But yeah, I mean, uh, look, it, two in, in the space of two oval races, he's gone from having no podium to having a podium and adding to that with a win 
Yeah. And uh, like he's had a couple of close calls. Gateway 21 comes to mind. Um, there was another one which I had in my mind, but I've since forgotten. But there was another yeah, one somewhere he, which he's had to closer co- he's had closer calls to than Pelo for, for oh. overwinds, certainly. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, he was mighty. He was mighty. I mean, the opening race was mainly between Kirkwood and Newgarden just because it started in the front row, but her her to didn't qualify that well in comparison to Kirkwood. Um, he qualified ninth to be exact. Um, although I think there were a couple of penalties that might be might not be too representative. Um, but yeah, he came came through the field clinically. He was one of the biggest movers early on, and then sort of midway through when the race started getting to its rhythm, Herta looked really really strong. Um, O'Ward went on that sort of different strategy late on, um, which kind of proved out to be the right strategy, but by accident. Um, but Herta had the had the advantage on, on the fresher tyres and the lesser fuel, and from about lap one fifty, maybe even before that, it looked it looked like her to had it in the bag, and sort of a hometown win adds to his Laguna win and Long Beach win, and he was he was so so impressive, so fast um, the entire day, and and the move he made for the win was was brave. Stingray Rob getting involved, um, sort of pushing O'Ward to the high line, her to sort of gap on the low line, absolutely went for it and it was a fantastic move which which never to be sealed in the race with the four four laps left so great performance from colton the first over win as you said it rounds like what has been a really good season for her there's been two seasons where he hasn't lived up to expectations we know he had that winless 2023 and he looked towards this year and he has actually been the most one of the most consistent drivers he's only had four finishes outside the top 10 about about three, I think all four of them are, who were his own doing for little mistakes, but ends up second in the championship. And it, I, I think that's fairly well deserved from her. He's had a good year, and this is the perfect way to end it off. Yeah, I, I think you you you're totally right. He just needs to cut out those those few mistakes, which he has absolutely kind of minimised this year compared to to seasons gone by. And I mean, this is a, a, a astronomical upturn. I mean, he finished tenth in the championship the last two years, so. I mean, it's it's a huge bounce back, I think, and consistency kind of is the watchword there. Consistency, I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six podiums. I'm, I'm counting three live. Um, <laughs> <laughs> six podiums, two wins. I mean, I think he had, what, one podium last year. So, I mean, it's been a phenomenal season. I think he's a totally worthy. I think, I think really, those top four in the standings have been a, a class apart this year. Um, and I, I think he's a completely worthy second place finisher in the standings and I think kind of aside from McLaughlin I would say Hurst has probably been the most impressive driver on ovals this year uh, he, he could easily have won at, won at Iowa for instance if it wasn't for being completely burnt by the uh, pillow caution uh, trapped a lap down by that so I think this season we've seen two two overtakes in particular for the ages really i think new gardens obviously last lap around the outside uh, on award the 500 causing a bit of pain for dan and then causing more pain for dan this was just unbelievable from colson herter i mean talk about talk about bravery i mean i thought when i saw it happening he was gonna go straight into rob's rear left wheel and possibly even be like catapulted airborne i'm not sure how we managed to kind of time it that perfectly. I mean, an inch either way for, for either of those guys, and it would have been contact and a pretty huge accident. So, I mean, the way he managed to thread the needle there, I mean, clearly he was so desperate to get that win. He, he took that risk, but I, mean, I can't, I don't think I can quite put into words how good an overtake that was. That was unbelievable. Um, and yeah, I guess. I mean, obviously, statistically, his, his previous best, I think, was third in the standings. This is possibly his, his best season to date in IndyCar. A good opportunistic move. Yeah, I mean, I think O'Ward is a bit unfortunate that Rob sort of just blocked the low line and her to basically shot the gap when it was when when it opened up a little bit. So that 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 was good. But I'm not taking away from a great overtake. Um, um, and yeah, I think next year we're, we're looking at Herter as a serious championship contender because he's got road courses or street courses now and he's got over. I mean, it's like, I know we say this every year, but there's four or five, I think, Pelo, Herter, we've got Ward, and I think you have to put the likes of New Garden Power and Dixon in there as well. 
just look complete on both track types. Um, and I'm glad because Herta is a driver who should be in the championship mix. And Andretti downsizing, I think, has made a difference this year as well. There's been a clear step up in performance. I think Ovals was kind of the place where they really needed to make the biggest strides. And we've absolutely seen that this year. I mean, you know, you look at, at Kirkwood getting pole this weekend. Herta obviously got a pole back at back at Iowa. And obviously, that was with the hybrid problem as well. He could easily have got double pole that weekend. Um, but I, I think, I almost think the way the championship standings have kind of panned out a fair i actually do feel like mclaughlin and her to have probably had better years than power i think power had this real lull mid-season which probably cost him um whereas her and mclaughlin have had the odd race here and there and you know if it wasn't for st pete or you know some other things out of his well, control or in his control if, mclaughlin could have been champion um, if not for st pete mclaughlin would be champion yeah, so, I mean, he'll be ruining that. I, I think there's also the perspective he could look at it as, you know, this is my, what is this, fourth season in in fourth single full seaters? Season, yeah. Fourth full season in single seaters. He's finished as the lead Penske two years in a row. He is the, the lead Chevy car two years in a row. Third in the championship two years in a row. And the fact that he is in a position where if something that was essentially out of his control didn't go, you know, a different way, he would be champion. I think... But I can really see Polo, McLaughlin, Herter being kind of the guys to beat next year, as long as kind of nothing goes against them in the way that, you know, things have for McLaughlin, St. Pete, Long Beach this year, kind of being the major ones that, you know, he went into the third round of the season essentially on five points. So, I mean, yeah, we've got, we've got an awful lot of time to re reflect on all of this, all of the, the what ifs, what could have been, but I think just the step forward to, to circle back to her so that he has made this year has been probably one of the most impressive things I think I've seen this season because, you know, he, he's obviously started off so strong in his IndyCar career and then things just, just tailed off a bit. I, and that was, I guess, largely kind of connected to Andretti having struggles. I know they, they kind of struggled as a team. Obviously Rossi had a big downturn after the aero screen, for instance, and people started to, to maybe say, Oh, you know, is Herter as good as people people say he is? Is he this kind of F1 caliber driver? You know, Alex Pelot jokes in the press conference. Alex, no, sorry, Paso Ward jokes in the press conference that him and him and Colton, who, who kind of came through the ranks together, karting, indie lights, they could have been in F1 together. And I think Herter now might have his super license. Um, he says it's too late anyway. But yeah, I, I think this is just a reminder of how good he is. And he is still as much as he says it's too late for the super license, extremely young and with an extremely long career ahead of him, which should, if, if all continues on this trajectory, boast, I, I would say, multiple championships. So spoiler for next week, but McLaughlin is my driver of the season. McLaughlin is also my driver of the season. <laughs> Sorry, we've so just maybe... ruined next week's episode. but, <laughs> but no, Maybe it's not as outrageous as I thought. But... No, it's. Yeah. I don't think it's as outrageous as you thought at all, given that, yeah, okay, Pelos had a cracking season, but so much went against McLaughlin. Um, you said O'Ward wasn't one of the top oval drivers this year, Hurt and McLaughlin, and I'm going to prove you wrong. Um, that is his third runner-up on O'Ward this year. Okay, well, I, I did forget. I did, and he's got a win. Yeah, okay, I did. And he had two mechanicals. That. I'm really and bad at remembering. Mechanicals. I'm really bad at remembering the stats. So yeah, okay. Any, he, other, he, any other race was sick. So. His his name is is worth putting in that category then as well. Okay, yeah. Um, I didn't. I did like I kind he, of didn't realize it was quite that good. Yeah, he had a good race as well. Like he got a bit unlucky in the first caution when Rosenquist the wall. That was a bit of a shame. Rosenquist seems to like accidentally screw a ward over every time on over race. I don't know what it is. Texas twenty three this year, Indy five hundred twenty something. I can't remember what it was. Um, twenty three. Sorry. I don't know what it is with Rosenquist and his best mate, but you know, it's just, <laughs> just hurting him every time. But they went on a strategy. Pretty just, cold, just, cool. to, just to say, Paso's off to, to Rosenquist's uh, yes. wedding, I think, this week. He's missing the F1 duties in Singapore, which he is then, I think, on for the rest of the season. Yes, he is. Um, but, but yeah, it was a good performance. When the old strategy, it did sort of work uh, after getting a lap down. So, fair play to McLaren. And look, awards, awards year, I know, like, his race there isn't too much to delve into because he was sort of 13th and then then pulled it out, pulled the rabbit out of the hat with strategy. Um, 
he's had a, he's had a weird year. Look, he's had six finishes inside the top two, which is really good. There's only one that's put in the had the whole of last year. But you look at races like Long Beach, races like Alabama, races like Toronto, where he lost a lot of points. Gateway and Milwaukee, mechanical failures. And look, we can say this for pretty much any driver in the top five, but it would have won them the championship a lot. I think, as you said, McLaren have got a few things to iron out. It was better than they did last year, I think, um, when you compare the two seasons. Um, but they clearly have work to do. And they've got Christian Lingard coming in next year who's going to be an interesting addition. I think he's going to be a real match for O'Ward on road and street courses. I don't think he will be when it comes to Ovals. Um, but looking at Nashville, it was a good race. Good race for O'Ward. And I think you want to end your season on a high. And um, ends up fifth in the standings, which I don't think is too bad. I think that's pretty fair in the grand scheme of things. So, um, yeah, just got a bit unlucky with Rob, but I think Hertha probably would have had him anyway. So, yeah. It's not the unfortunate, well, it's fortunate and unfortunate strategy, but it's the way things work out in, in a race like this, isn't it? So, yeah, I mean, Oward was on, he was on all tyres. He said he couldn't even, t you couldn't even speak to his team because the vibration was so bad. I think he was on the reds actually at that point. So, they've, they've sorted on ovals, I think, Aaron McLaren. At least, at least Oward is, is such, I think, a caliber of oval driver that, that they're fine. I think where I compare his season to essentially the top four is that. The top four, when you look at these errant races that they've had, it's not really been a performance issue. And I think, you know, if that it's been, you know, if Hurt are throwing it away at Detroit or, or what have you, kind of making errors or or then something out of their control as well. I think obviously Indy's another one with Hurt that was a huge loss. Um I think where I kind of put a word in just a bracket below and think he, they still need to step forward for the championship is that some of those errant weekends, okay, he had a few mechanicals and had a few messy weekends himself, which he did He did well to cut out as well. But I think it's just those few weekends where Aaron McLaren have just been left kind of scratching their heads a little bit, where they don't really know what the issue is. I think Rossi's spoken about this a bit on, on his podcast, that, you know, there's, there's been times where they've been slow or they've been quick and they don't, uh, or well, or it's fluctuated throughout a weekend and they don't really know why. Um and that's not something I think you can have from a championship caliber caliber team. I think O'Ward is a championship caliber driver. I just think this Aaron McLaren operation, who obviously compared to Penske, Andretti, Ganassi, are a much, much younger team. Um, they still have, I think, a few things to figure out on that side. Um, because because there were weekends like Portland, for example, the Indy GP, where they were just so far off the pace and there was... Just no explanation why they were just all slow. Well, yeah, and you look at, for instance, the Indy GP where they had two drivers on the podium last year, and this year, nowhere. So that's that's the sort of thing they have to figure out, and they could figure it. Next year could be the year they figure it out, and Owood could be a contender. But I think, yeah, they made a few strides forward from this year. It, I think Owood's two seasons generally were were fairly similar. I think they obviously had the peak performance this year of those those couple of well, those three wins actually. If you if you count St. Pete, which I still don't think he counts, but it is technically a win. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, that that's enough on that. I think that's that's my point made. And again, we'll, yeah, we'll dive into we've got more. Twenty four weeks to do this. So, um, yeah, let's come to the red tires. Experimented result in a tire strategy like I did at Gateway last year, and yet again, I don't think it really did anything. Don't think yeah. it added much. Yeah, it seemed to work out in a pretty similar way. I would say. Uh, I think some drivers did seem to struggle a bit more, like. Power yes. starts on the alternates, and I don't know whether it was a tyre thing because it was it was super early in the race for it to kind of happen. But he did drop really, really quickly. Um, Marcus Ericsson was one. He he crashed because of I don't know just a, a set of alternates that were not were not cooperating really. He <laughs> he waited quite late. I think he he used primaries in his first couple of stints, and then then had two alternates to get through, which. Yeah, had to, as soon as you had to stretch them a bit longer, that, that didn't work out. Um, so, yeah, I, I think obviously there was a bit more degradation later on, but I, I didn't, yeah, it wasn't enough to really notice. Like, you know, they were, they were a quick attire. We saw saw Roman Grosjean use them in, in qualifying, for instance, and he qualified about a mile per hour lower than, than teammate Connor Daly, which is probably kind of to attribute. Oh, sorry. Grosjean used the primaries in qualifying while everyone else used the alternates. Um, 
and th there was a differential, obviously, there with a the quicker qualifying tyre. Um, but I don't think, again, the fact that it was only a mile per hour difference, I don't think there was a huge difference. And I don't think there was ever going to be a huge difference because, you know, Firestone weren't just going to, you know, bring a highly degradational, I don't know if that's even a word, a highly degradational compound that risks failures. Uh, they, they just weren't going to do that for the finale without any testing on the tyre. Um Listen, I don't mind the concept. Maybe it adds a little bit more kind of a factor. And, you know, O'Ward was on the, the alternates, obviously, and was, was struggling late on. And that allowed her to, to, to maybe make the gains that he did along with the traffic. But, yeah, I, I don't. Do you want to see it again? Uh, I, I think I'd like to see it again with more testing and maybe a, maybe a, a compound that degrades more. But at the same time, we've had so many great races at, at your likes of Iowa. Even looking back to Milwaukee, where it's, like one, where it's one compound that degrades a lot, and that makes a great race anyway. You don't need to complicate it by adding a second tire. I don't like. I don't think it makes enough of a difference to go. Yes, this is essential. We need this every race. Yeah, it like we be. we weren't looking at the race as, as we caught, as we recorded yesterday and thinking, oh great, this this is a great race because of the alternate tires. I mean, I, we we could be wrong, but I, it was just wasn't something that seemed to be a, a major factor. New Garden, third place. He was strong all day, qualified second. He's had a rough year, but that's actually his somehow a sixth podium of the year, which was really bizarre to say. But, um, really? Yeah. Sixth? Um, yeah. How many of those America, have come on over? Um, three have come on ovals. Four. Okay. Four have come on ovals, sorry. Okay. So, so yeah, I, I feel like he's not had as spectacular a year. Really, he's, had, on, he's, had on the a, he's had a good ending, though. I know Milwaukee was a tough weekend, but he's had three podiums in the last five races. So. Yeah, he was. He was not happy in the press conference. He was, I, I mean, he feels he should have won that race. He, I, I don't know. Yeah, I can, I can see why. I can was see he one? Was he one that really dropped back on the alternates? Actually, was that when it, when it seemed to really kind of ebb away from him, and then he came back again in that last stint. Had obviously had that that duel with McLaughlin, which, as I said earlier, was superb. Um, yeah, I, he he was he wasn't happy. He, I think he felt he should have won. He also felt he should have been on pole. Um, <laughs> I think he, the sooner he can leave 2024, much like last year, but to an even greater extent this year, I think the, the sooner he can leave that in the past, the, the better. Um, obviously, yeah, it looked like it started so well in St. Pete, kind of was put on the back foot by that and just had errant weekend after errant weekend. And yeah, okay, but he's, he's even, ended even, much better. But. Even with St. Pete, he only moved up one place in the standings. So. That's the thing. I, I, I can't help but feel that may have kind of had an impact though i don't know whether he felt like he was maybe left chasing a bit after that or it, it must do something i think mentally more so for him obviously having won that race than the mclaughlin and for him being obviously the accused party who everyone's now calls calling a cheat and everyone's now kind of i don't know kind of he's getting booed at driver intros and stuff and you know he doesn't seem like you know, some some guys you look at you know, like a Juan Pablo Montoya who would completely embrace being this kind of villainous figure. New Garden doesn't strike me as that sort of guy, and I, I I've got to think that has had some sort of an impact. Um, I mean, he's a guy that I'm not really even looking at for the championship next year, but uh, there's every chance if he cuts out, you know, the few. I mean, last, I suppose last year he was so cost a bit by by performance as well of the team and they've really made that step forward this year so this year i mean there was a lot of circumstance that prevented him in some occasions but also there were just really poor weekends as well so kirkwood was fourth probably had a great weekend i thought probably a bit unfortunate not to be on the podium uh but took the pole led the most laps really good weekend for kirkwood and he hasn't really had this sort of peak performance in overalls so i think that's good from his perspective so um, I thought it was a great weekend for Carl Kirkwood. So, I, think was, I think that was one of his best weekends in IndyCar full stop, to be honest. Um, I think he, he's felt that he hasn't been doing a good enough job in oval qualifying, that he's been racing all right. But I think his best his best finish before that, I, I don't even know if he'd finished inside the top five on an oval, to be honest. I think it might have been seventh off the top of my head. Um, so... I mean, this was a this was a huge upturn. It was it was it was definitely, regardless of what his best finish was previously, it was his best overall finish. I think the fact that he led so many laps is a a positive way for him to to end the season. And I think much like much like the New Garden, he 
he could have won this race. I think he was probably on a par with with Herter. Um, again, he was he was just another guy that was was burnt by a yellow. I think it was the first yellow he'd pitted. He was sent from having led the entire first stint down to down to tenth, and from there he was kind of recovering. I think the fact that he recovered up onto the podium spots were was encouraging, and then. You know, he led again he, when Herter stopped, he didn't, so he had to come in for a splash of fuel, and that that just drops him out of that game for, for contending for the win. So I guess he'll be disappointed to have missed out on the podium, but good weekend. McLaughlin fifth, Ferrucci, another really quietly good day in sixth. I mean, look, we're touching everybody's seasons, but Ferrucci's been absolutely superb, and that's another great result for the AJ40 team. It's the team's best finish since 2002 in the driver standings, and now it's time to touch on the fact that he will be back at the team next year. Um, and look, I think it, this was just a case of getting funding. Ferrucci and the team have made huge steps forwards and their lineup next year of Ferrucci and Malukas are so exciting. And yeah, I'm, it's one of the lineups of the season, potentially the third or fourth best lineup of any team. So that's really exciting towards next year. Well, that's a superb line. I mean, I think Ovals is the, the one thing that stands out, that they are two guys who could easily be race winners already on on ovals um but i mean it's not like they're slouches on on any other kind of track as, as well i mean ferrucci I, i'm trying to rack my brain for how many top tens he had coming into this weekend i believe he had is that 11 12 top tens 11 on the top tens this season he had one last year i think he had like three top 15s last year he's made up That's... 10 10 places in the standings which is astonishing really i mean that that partnership just had to continue him him and larry foy i mean they were kind of flirting with the idea after the portland poll and they were kind of yeah obviously <laughs> they, they obviously wanted to continue it would have just been circumstance if they didn't you know completely out of their control so um seventh was marcus armstrong um ahead of venus lunkfus i think both have been proved to be quite handy able drivers i think lunkfus especially um well, I guess it's also Armstrong's first year on over, so I've got to hear, give him some credit too. But Lundqvist, it's a rough start to the year, but he's ended up with with three overall, po three overall top eights um, in the last four over races of the year. So I think that was pretty pretty solid for Lundqvist. And Armstrong too, has had a great year on over. I hope both find somewhere in the series next year. I'd like to see Lundqvist a bit more. Obviously, he is the rookie of the year, but um, solid days for both. Um, and yeah, well, let's just hope we see see them on the grid because uh, Armstrong's obviously got a bit of budget. Lundqvist doesn't, but. We can only hope. <laughs> yeah, I think actually what Armstrong's done on ovals is is kind of even more impressive because Lundqvist had obviously done, uh, albeit only a very sort of slim handful of oval races, but he had raced ovals in the junior categories. Coming into the 500 this year, which he had a mechanical failure within a matter of laps, Armstrong hadn't even raced on an oval and he's been in the top 10 pretty much every oval race since then. Maybe Three missed out times. once. Okay. Kemp and I were... Eighth in Gateway, seventh in Nashville. Well, I think had third in Gateway, sixth in Milwaukee, eighth in Nashville. Okay, so I, I think I, I've been impressed. Yeah, I've, I've been impressed with both of them. I think Lundqvist kind of almost reminded me a bit of what we've seen from Malukas uh, on ovals as a as a rookie, obviously with a more competitive team. But yeah, I, I mean, they both, I think, have done enough to, to find a landing spot. I mean, just looking quickly at the standings. Oh, Lundqvist is rookie of the year, by the way. We haven't spoken about that. Yeah. If, oh, yeah. did you say I mean, that? We don't have much competition. But... We, we've yeah, not, but yeah, we've not. <laughs> that happened a couple of weeks ago, and we kind of just completely forgot to touch on it. I don't think. Yeah, I mean, it was never. There isn't anything to touch on. It. It, it was never expected, doubt, wasn't it? So. But yeah, Armstrong's yeah. actually ended the season fourteenth in points, which I think for your sophomore year with Ganassi is could could be better. Could I, be I think. Better. I agree. You look at some of the names above him: VK, Rosen, Chris Lungard. Can you be doing yeah. better than them? Lundqvist is 19 16. points behind and 16th. So, yeah, Which I don't pretty, think it's too bad for a Yeah, I think I said that's all right. Um, Malikas Knife, daily 10th. I mean, another great example of why they put him in the car. Cup's been a leader circle, which we'll get on to in a minute, actually. Um, uh, Pillow 11, VK 12th, Harvey 13th. That's his joint best result of the year. He got pretty lucky with the first caution, but managed to stay there all race long. Yeah, well, then was Christian Rasmussen. It was a good time to well, briefly touch on the leader circle because we don't have ages, but we previewed this last week. Um, the Rasmussen finished 14th, Fittipaldi finished 21st, and then Rob was 20th. Um, so Fittipaldi and Rasmussen made the cut. Rob missed out. Um, 
So for the pool, he had probably a slightly better day than we expected. I mean, he was didn't have a great day, but ahead of Graham. So look, I don't think Rob's particularly had a good year by any stretch of the imagination. And will he be around next year? Probably unlikely. He does obviously have budget, but yeah, I mean, he's missed out on the leader circle, and that is the most important thing for these entries. So. Not yeah, great. I think even if even if you have budget to bring, I think the fact of missing out in the, on the lead, on the leader circle is not something that teams will look at and think. Well, well, it's something that teams will probably consider and maybe cause them to have a second think. Um, yeah, I, I think just a word on Rasmussen. He's been he's been superb really since coming in, kind of being thrown in at short notice for these last last three races across the two ovals and. Again, I mean, he was not too far away from VK. VK has actually rounded out the season 13th in, in points. So he's still finished no higher than 12th, no lower than 14th. Uh, I think it was a, a decent season for him. Um, yeah, Rasmussen has really, really repaid uh, Ed's faith, I would say. Um, in fact, those, those leader circle cars were kind of running in tandem for quite a lot of the race. And I mean... I think RLL, have, regardless of, of actually making it, have probably been given a pretty big wake up call. Um, I mean, they were they were nowhere again. Lungard nineteenth, Ray Hall had a just disastrous day. He was he was down in twenty third, four laps down. So, so visiting out the rest of the order was Rossi, Grosjean, Dixon, completely anonymous was returned to Nashville. So that was a bit of a shame. It's weird. It's so so just on Dixon, it's been a weird year on overs for him because he's actually had some pretty good results, but it feels like a few races now where. His, I mean, I guess this is credit as well to Armstrong and Lukovic. They've qualified better and have kind of outperformed it. It's been a, it's been a strange one for Dixon. I think this is the yeah. probably only the second time in eighteen years maybe he's finished outside the top five yeah. and four or five in points. So it hasn't been a Dixon. I feel like we really haven't seen the Dixon for about half a season. Yeah, it's been I mean, a bit it's weird because he started really well as well. Yeah. I mean, he had. You know, Long Beach he won Detroit as well, and it looked like, oh my God, he's starting the season quickly. We know how well he ends the season; he could be a real threat. He looked like the guy who was possibly the favourite for the championship in the early stages a, yeah. a few months back, but petered out. And just Grosjean as well; he has ended up a place behind where I lot finished in the standings last year. So it's been a good year, but I think it possibly could have yeah. been better. Um. He was at a seagull. He crashed on Friday, so he had about four laps of practice, um, which was not good. So just on the crash, we just briefly touch on the bump. It was a launch pad. I'm surprised yeah. no one hit it in the race. Well, it was essentially like approaching a speed bump at 200 miles per hour, and it, it broke Kyle Kirkwood's car in, in final practice, which was pretty brutal. Uh, I mean, it, it thankfully didn't kind of damage any key aero parts, and he was still strong, but yeah, it seemed to cause some sort of suspension failure. Um, I would like to see that get smoothed out. I know Newgarden said, yeah, this sort of thing is, is kind of classified as character, but I don't think I've really seen any of the drivers who liked it. Um, but Louis, Louis Foster and Indy Next did say that it's kind of your own fault if you are being impacted by it, either in the way that you are driving or the way that the car is set up, like you can get around it. Um, maybe teams were just pushing, pushing the limits a bit hard, but they've clearly tried to grind it down a bit because, I mean, it was a completely different colour to every, every other part of the track. But, yeah, I think I'd like to see something sorted there because it seemed a bit of a safety issue. 19th, Link on the first race at RLL. 20th was Rob, 21st for the Pauli, 22nd Simpson. Ahead of Ray Hall, Power had the issue. Ericsson, who hit the wall after, yet again, it feels like a couple of times he had a decent day and ended up in the wall. Um, I had a leg hit the wall and Rosen Grisselli had a punch. You're really ashamed for Rosen because actually it's running well and hit the wall. So that was a bit of a shame. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. kind of, I think for Ericsson, that just rounds off a miserable season. I mean, why yeah. has he ended up in points 15th, which is, I mean, given he's been a, I mean, was he sixth for three successive seasons? So that it, it's just been, a, it's been an awful year for him. Well, Rosen Chris has had one top 10 since Detroit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, he, he probably should have had many more than that if things had just just yeah. not really gone his way. I think no, it's just a sad way for a positive year to end. And he, I mean, he could have been top ten in points if it if it wasn't for kind of things happening that that happened, which you could say for a lot of people. But I mean, yeah. NBC actually reported he's he's signed a new two year deal with Maya Shank, so they clearly love him. 
Um, it was just a pretty abrupt way for his year to end. And in terms of leg, um, I feel like we've maybe seen a few too many of these mistakes from her. I, I guess it's understandable. She's been out of the car for a long time. It was, you know, she just basically, I think, fit up all the kind of took the air off her and she didn't quite manage to, to hold on to it. She did a slight <laughs> tap of the wall. It didn't look like there was much damage, to be honest. It looked like she could have got back to the pits, but. Yeah, not a, is, it, is it again a sad way to end this kind of run of races that she's had? Not sure. I guess she'll be back for the five hundred, maybe. Archie, one final time, your unsung hero from Nashville. Oof. Um. Okay, it's it's kind of a trying to define what unsung is, isn't it? Um, I'm going blink fist. Come on. Solid day, qualified really well, was in the mix, and ends off what has been a roller coaster season with a quite a nice result. And he was I quicker think, than Pelé pretty much for this long. I think, McLaughlin, I think McLaughlin's drive uh, hasn't been yeah. kind of talked about enough. He, he made up 13 places because he also had an engine penalty. Um, I'll go for Santino Ferrucci, I think, because it, it wasn't a day where we saw the same fireworks from him. Uh, he had a bit of contact actually late on with McLaughlin, which may have prevented another top five. Uh, I think he's just ended the year spectacularly, really. Uh, a really phenomenal year ended in a spectacular fashion. I, I'll go for him. Funny moment? Uh, I had a few. I think, I mean, just to mention, actually, uh, because of weather, which I think we got quite lucky with weather, to be honest, because of, I mean, there was a hurricane, basically, and they kind of managed to avoid the brunt of it. There was, they managed to get through qual uh, first practice, even though that was delayed, well, abbreviated because of seagulls incident but uh, yeah it did finally rain after qualifying which meant we had a night practice really want to see more more night racing but the kind of continued delays there led to some funny stuff happening pato ward was complaining he was hungry and then started eating pizza just before he got in the car which doesn't seem like something an athlete should be doing but anyway he was also doing cartwheels on pit lane um the booth one last time with kevin Hinch, Townsend, yeah, we think one last time inside. anyway, unless they all end up at Fox. Yep. Um, huge thank you to NBC for being a great servant, obviously. Um, yeah, uh, they phoned Joseph, they FaceTimed Joseph Newgarden while he was live on the camera, which was amusing. I also saw a picture of Zach Brown congratulating Pato after the race wearing a Pato Who hat. And he also had a Pato Who hat in the background when he was filming his like <laughs> congratulatory message. Oscar Piastri for winning the uh, the F1 race in Baku. So they're all no, no like yeah. headline what, what, what for any out? I, I think, I think be... Scott. My favorite bit is Scott Porchetta appearing in everything. Yeah, he put his face everywhere he could. Hey, that was my favorite. He, he deserves it. He deserves it. I also agree. When when they had a uh, they're putting out info pre weekend about the the weather situation, the procedures. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a bit a picture of him sitting on a car uh, next exactly. to the statement. So yeah, yeah, that takes the crown. That takes the Borsche crown. Thank you for remembering that. Yes, Porsche passing his his face everywhere. Um, we'll do a like a proper like next week. We'll do like a season funniest moment. I think we both know what's going to win, but there, there's a few. Yeah, uh, there are there are a few actually. Uh, we know what's going to win. But, hey, we'll keep it for next week. Do we? I'm Georgina. Oh, of course. I yeah. I was thinking of uh, I was thinking of Chip's tweet. I still can't get that out of my head. <laughs> right, we'll look, we'll go we'll go into that next week. Now, before the bit you're all waiting for, we're going to do the news um, because I'm going to keep your anticipation higher. Um, Pato Award running FP1 in Mexico. He might be on a billboard if if he's lucky enough um, to advertise the race. But um, that's awesome. He's obviously done a few. She's, Outings in, in Abu Dhabi, sorry, but doing it in front of his home crowd, where we said it's been immensely popular, in one of the front running F1 cars is going to be awesome. So, so cool. cool. I think really fitting as well, given the events of uh, the last few weeks, but that, that's such a cool opportunity for him. I think, I mean, hopefully it gives some good exposure to, to Indy cars. Hope, well. Hopefully he does well, and we can say, I yeah. got, our drivers are this good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I guess it's a well. I, I wouldn't say there's pressure because stepping into an F F one card, no one expects you to be competitive. But it's a bonus if he is competitive. People can suddenly see when they're saying, "Oh, well, IndyCar's just for retired F one drivers who aren't good enough." But hey, look, we we've got these guys who. I mean, he he did well when he was in Abu Dhabi last year, so I've got hope. 
Yeah, I, I've, I think he's going to be awesome. And I really hope he, he is because he's such an asset to the series. And I think he'll, he'll be fantastic. And he's a front running car. And look, at the end of the day, he's an experience for Pato. He's driving an F1 car mm. in the city where everybody knows him, everybody loves him. And as I said, he might be on a billboard if he's lucky enough. So. Everybody knows him. Nobody nobody knows him, apparently. Not as popular as Adrian Fernandez, is he? So, Adrian Pato, Fernandez. Pato is Pato who? Um, and the news I'm really excited about Kyle Larson is back for the Indy 500. I think we all expected it. Last year, we know it didn't work out the way it should have done. Rain messed up his day, but it's back and I'm so excited to see him back. He's now, he, he hopefully now knows how to do restarts. He now knows how to not speed in pit lane. This is going to be so exciting and hopefully he gets to actually do it this time around. Yeah, I mean, it's huge. I, I know he was, he was obviously competitive last year, but with this this kind of campaign, this this May of learning under his belt, you only have to feel you'll go from strength to strength. He kind of knows what's what now procedurally. He knows, yeah, he, he's had that race experience, even if it didn't pan out as he as he wanted. I know things were kind of tempered a little bit by, you know, for instance, last year the the press conference announcing it was was hosted at IMS. This year it was hosted in Charlotte, and Rick Hendrick made a point uh, clearly. I think he was prompted by the moderator, so. Clearly, this was planned that Charlotte and the Coke 600 is the priority. If there's rain, he will be pulled out of the Indy 500, which I, I've still got to think if he's if he's leading the 500 in a rain and there's a rain delay, I, I just can't I just can't see it being a thing where he's pulled out. You know, he's already got a cup championship, for instance. Do you then, you know, how much does Rick Hendrick want to win an Indy 500? I would imagine he really wants to win an Indy 500 as much as he is a NASCAR guy. So... Yeah, there was mention that, that Tony Canaan will indeed do a refresher. Um, uh, according to I think you Nathan Brown, mid race. So yeah, I, according to Nathan Brown, there has been no rule change yet. But I think that's a rule I would like to see changed. That you can then. I don't know why you wouldn't allow a relief driver if they've done a refresher. Um, that would be nice. So then, if indeed Larson did have to to run away for the the sake of Hendrick and NASCAR and you know making the playoffs and being able to get that wave well not being able to get the waiver because they were pretty strict on that this year then at least allow it allow Canaan to to finish the deal and maybe get two faces on the trophy the moment you have all been waiting for the uh I know the championship probably wasn't as exciting this is as exciting the, the fast six and podium predictor tournaments which have been going all season long we'll start off with the podium predictor tournament um so points wise this week I went for Dixon McLaughlin Power. Remember, I was a championship leader. That scored me zero. And I must, say, I must say, I must say at this stage, Dan did show his his podium. Just well, he did show he showed it he showed it to me because I had such a near insurmountable gap. So bear that in mind when you hear my prediction. So on that, you went for New Garden Herter Award. So you got the podium right, but not the right order. So that's five points. Oh the yeah, I, went... oh yeah. Because I do after the race, I didn't realize that New Garden was on the podium because again, in everything that was happening, her to getting his win so excitingly, Pelone winning the championship, I knew A Ward was second. I thought Kirkwood had finished third, and at one point, New Garden it was New Garden, uh, Herter, and then O'Ward was down the order. So, oh, no, it was close, it was so play. close. Writers, New Garden, O'Ward, Pelone that's four, FMS, Power Dixon, Ferrucci, that's zero, Josh. Mason, McLaughlin Power Award, that's two. Tom Gaymore, my biggest contender. Power New Garden Herter, that's three. Fans, Dixon Polo Rossi, that's zero. And Ellie Award Power Dixon, that's two. So, the final standings of 2024. In joint seventh, it's Fallen Model Shop and the Dive Bomb Followers. They are both on 26. Ellie is in sixth place with 31. Josh Mason is in fifth with 33. Third place, in joint third place. Is the Die Pom Indy Car Writers and Archie on 41. So, therefore, I can crown the winner of the 2024 Die Pom Podium Predictor Tournament as myself. I've done it. I've done it. I held on by one point versus Tom Gaymore. Tight. Stinker last week. Stinker last week. But I am the champion. I, uh, oh, I'm delighted. I'm delighted. Live interview. I'm so proud. This is the greatest moment in my life. I've got to thank Formula Model Shop for the sponsorship. I've got to thank all the partners. I've got to thank all the listeners. This is a truly great moment. Um, but it's all it's all down to the team. It's all the work of the team for this one. So so thank you to, to, the, to the team and all, all, all the sponsors for this. But anyway, 
Delightful. I'm, ha I'm happy to have clawed back a joint third because the deficit was obviously significant after last week. <laughs> now, far six predicted tournament. You lead by one point. Now, this is different because we have not seen each other's predictions. So we fired them away in a form this week. I'm really nervous I'm about this. My, my heart them. is racing. I've not seen them. So the far six, just so you know. Kirkwood, Newgarden, Rosenfist, Power, Ferrucci, and Malukas. Fine. So you might have to read that because I've gotten half of them already. But we'll go on to my predictions first. So I went for Triple Penske. So that's Newgarden and McLaughlin done. I went for Malukas. Uh, Newgarden, Newgarden and Power. Were in the... Newgarden and Power, sorry. I went for Malukas, so that's an extra point. I went for Rossi, uh, which didn't pair, fare out too well. And I went for Herta. So that's three. So if you get two, we'll be joint champion. If you get three, you'll be the champion. You went for Palo, Tower, McLaughlin, Herta, Dixon, and O'Ward. So I think... Can you... Can... One. Can you, yeah, can you figure out why I did that? Top six in the standings. Because I thought qualifying was going to be rain. I, I was hedging ah, that qualifying was going to be rained smart. out. I was well, it wasn't to... smart. Because it oh, yeah, it wasn't smart. I was trying to hedge uh, what, what was the kind of least risky thing to do. And at the point of making predictions, everyone was panicking that, that there was a hurricane coming. <laughs> so hurricane, whatever its name was, has lost me the thing because I would otherwise have put New Garden. <laughs> so yeah, again, I've got to crown myself as the champion. So thanks to Fallen Mother Shop, thanks to Archie for playing along, thanks for everybody. But yeah, I'm delighted, double champion. That feels good. Pelo can't say they didn't win two championships <laughs> in one year. So well, I can. congratulations, congratulations. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I'm, like... I'm a little bit disappointed after a year of a year of predicting to to miss out by a point. But it's been a, it's been a fun battle. It's been fun. I've enjoyed it. We'll definitely do it again next year. I've got to thank you know everyone who's playing along, like Tom Gaymore, Josh Mason, Fallen Water Shop. Um, you as the fans and the writers, thanks for playing along. Really hope you enjoyed it. I know we certainly did, and long may it continue. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, but it's with a heavy heart. I've got to say that's it. That's yep. it for 2024. Uh, and I mean, we are already back at this stage now. The St. Pete counter is back. I'll, I'll try and remember to end every episode with just a <laughs> slightly lower number by seven days. So we are recording here on Monday. So the day after uh, after Nashville, it is 165 days. And as you listen to this, or if you listen to it when it drops, it will be 164 days. Um, I'm not sure how we're at this point already, where we are <laughs> talking about how many days it is till St. Pete. Yeah. It feels a matter of days ago that I was kind of updating the counter every night before I went to bed. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, anyway, it's it's sad. I mean, it was obviously as I kind of touched on, it's particularly sad, particularly sad seeing, you know, NBC sign off. Really good servant, phenomenal team. Um, they put together a really good video to kind of end their coverage, voiced by Lee Diffie, which I think was fitting. And I, I think both for, from our side, Dan, it's been. An honour and a, a privilege covering the series this year and it's hard not to feel like it's the end of Christmas, the end of that Christmas period when it all comes to an end, the Christmas tree goes down and you no, know, I, I think just a huge thanks to, to everyone who's tuned into the podcast this year and we'll, we'll have you covered over the next 20 plus episodes to, to quell the sadness until it gets to, to previewing next year so stay tuned. The IndyCar season might be over. You might be wondering what to do in between your spare time listening to podcast episodes. One thing I'd definitely recommend is going to Formula Model Shop. Check all the merchandise they sell there. You never know. It might even get cheaper in this off season. Formula Model Shop is the best place to get your IndyCar merchandise in the UK and the rest of Europe. So how better to spend your time there in the off season? You can use the discount code 5 bomb or one word, F-I-V-E-B-O-M-B, -B, to gain 5% off products on the FMS site. Visit the highlights on the Dive on Motorsport Instagram account for a link to an exclusive VIP section on the FMS store, courtesy of Dive Bomb. Or you can head to the Dive Bomb website with a link to the Formula Model Shop on our homepage, or you can check out formulamodelshop.co.uk. Stay tuned for exclusive giveaways, events, and other content. What, what are you going to take away from the season? One sort of final memento from the season. Um, 
well, if, if you kind of sum up the season, it's been a weird season. I, I think there's been a lot of, you, you know, IndyCar, we often think of it as this kind of, and I'm not saying it hasn't been fun and super entertaining. It absolutely has been, but it feels like we've had a lot of controversy this year. We've had obviously the push to pass stuff. We've had, you know, recently the Mark Miles comments. It's, you know, we've had, we've, there's been a lot of stories, haven't there? We, we've had obviously all the Aaron McLaren chopping and changing of drivers. It feels like there's been a lot of storylines in addition to the racing this year. Um, but again, I think as always, it's been thoroughly entertaining. I think especially latterly on track. I think there were worries, of course, with the, the hybrid coming in and the first few races were not particularly good. Um but I think it's always a good marker of having had another really good season when you do kind of come away from it really kind of glum at the fact that we've got to wait nearly six months and, until we do it all over again. Um, so, yeah, it's been a, a season of, I guess, a lot of ups and downs for for and within the series, I would say. I think I think the, the lasting memory for me will be that, that Joseph Newgarden press conference after the, the whole push to pass thing, because that was kind of an unprecedented situation really um but i think again looking on track we've we've witnessed greatness again from alex Pillow, and i think we will look back on these seasons in years to come and kind of marvel at the the kind of legendary stuff that we are we are witnessing really um, i'll hand it over to you what, what are your thoughts yeah as you said, we've had all the stuff off track and, you know, as journalists, it's great to cover it. But I think IndyCar always does its talking on track and it's it's been yet another season where the racing just really has prevailed. It's The great thing about this is that it's more unpredictable than Formula One, for example, but it's not crazy. You still have some sort of element of consistency about it, which, which is great about it. It's not wildly unpredictable, but it it is neither predictable in the same way and We've had so many great memories, you know, as much as I hated it, New Gone's pass on O'Ward will be remembered for, for decades to come in the Indy 500. I think Carl Larson's first appearance at the Speedway reaching the Fast Six is going to be something that I remember for, for years to come. It's going to be a story told for generations. And the returns on Milwaukee and Nashville were both absolutely fantastic. Um, and we've just had so many great memories looking across the season. We've had so many ups and downs so many heroes and so many zeros throughout the season and it's just what makes indycar so great there's no that i everybody who watches indycar is just so invested because it's such a great series and this season is just backed it up saint Pete, petersburg feels like yesterday when we were when we were covering it and it's just flown by as it always does every year and Look, IndyCar will get criticised for comments or whatever, but at the end of the day, the package they bring is still absolutely fantastic. And we are privileged to watch so many great drivers from so many backgrounds, so many different generations compete at the top level of the series. And from the thrills of the Indy 500, from the Snooze Fest of Iowa, from the Tricky Streets of Detroit to the, the, the season finale in Nashville, which is excellent been such a pleasure and i've just i loved it it's been such a great season so many memories to look back on and it's just a shame it's over isn't it yeah i, I think i think the indy 500 does bear mention it's mm -hmm. obviously we had the rain delay i, I guess it only built the anticipation and i think we had one of the greatest shows probably the series has ever seen in, it, in its most iconic race um and I, I do just wish and i think the series possibly maybe are working on this the season does get extended somehow whether with this this international series or or whatever it is because you know there's such momentum during the season there, there can be such momentum during the season you know when the product is as good as it is it's just such a shame that it comes to this end and you have to wait as i've said so many times the best part of six months before you see cars racing again uh, it is it's such a shame but i've got to give a lot of thank yous um this was our first season covering indycar as a credit to journalists so i've got to thank everybody indycar particularly dave and arnie for listening for 
all the work they've put in and supporting us and um, in producing content as well. We've got exclusives for you guys every episode about what the drivers are saying at the press conferences. And that's been such a pleasure to speak to some some people who are almost superhuman to us and the guys we look up to. And that, that's always such a such a great honour. I've got to thank people at Formula Model Shop for supporting this, supporting the podcast and giving you guys such a great deal and helping us out some of our episodes. We've had some great giveaways across the year and etc and that's been really appreciated by us all um and there's something more thank you as you said the drivers whether that's toby sowry kiffin simpson louis foster nolan siegel even callum Isla earlier in the year it, it's a pleasure to speak to these drivers and the opportunity and time they give up to speak to us we're a nobody to them but they're still giving up their time just to speak about the love of the sport really which is which is the most important thing and it's been such a great year and look i've got to thank yourself archie um, as well as ellie for joining me on the podcast this year it's been great to chat to you i'd have nothing to do um a solo podcast isn't as appealing by myself so I've, I've got to say a huge thank you to you and giving up your time to do this every week yeah no a huge thanks to you dan as well i think people don't see the work that goes on behind the scenes dan editing the podcast and the early hours of the morning every week on a on a monday uh, after we never really ever managed to record the podcast after a race on a sunday silly time zones but but hey no i, I really appreciate you guys and it's it's really fun doing this every week and we are not going anywhere across the off season you know keep coming back no. to us for your indycar fix because we will we'll keep it going no and i think the most important person i think is you listeners you're the reason why we do this every week if we got zero listens every week there, there probably wouldn't be much point in doing this but um, we really appreciate listening to us. We hope you enjoy what we what we do because we love speaking about it and hopefully you love listening to us speak about it. And um, as, as Archie said, long may it continue. But I just want to say a huge thank you to you who listened because it is really appreciated by us. So again, if you have any feedback for the podcast, we're completely open. Please comment. Please message us at Dive on Motorsport on Instagram. Um, please message us on Twitter if you want to because your feedback is great to us. And also any questions as well. I think maybe, uh, I think we did this last year. We're trying sort of get a q and a going for for one off season podcast episode but kind of even just week by week if you you have any questions you'd like us to answer we are kind of more than willing to to be guided by you because we may need stuff to be guided by in these next i don't know the exact amount of weeks but but 20 plus weeks i'll just keep on saying so <laughs> yeah if you ever want to get in touch feel feel free and we'll happily discuss anything you would like to be discussed and look, as Archie said, this is not the end. We will keep you covered for for the rest of the off season. We'll have a season review next week, and we'll do a couple of things um, to review the season over the course of the next few weeks. And we will keep that going, hopefully, until St. Petersburg next season. It will be a bit different going forwards. It will just be me and Archie for um, the foreseeable future. Um, we might have a few guests join us along the way, um, but things will things will change. Um, but our overriding goal remains the same, which is bringing you podcast content of the highest quality or bringing you episodes you enjoy and speaking about IndyCar and helping grow the sport over in the UK because that is our goal. Yeah and I just a huge thank you to Ellie for, for kind of being a part of this for the last I guess best part of two seasons 18 months um, it's been kind of a real pleasure doing this as a trio. But me and Archie we still strive to do the best we can as just a duo there'll be maybe a few guests on there, as we said but we will continue striving um, for for IndyCar growth in the UK but that is it that's all we got from Nashville that's all we got for the 2024 season please stick around there are still plenty to come there's still plenty of talking points we'll give you all the news all the reactions all the quizzes anything you want and we'll be there but for one last time a massive thank you for watching and for listening throughout the course of the season and don't stick away because there will be a next time we'll see you now